started. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, I'm Sarah Samuels with ABNY and I'm going to kick it off to our wonderful YP steering committee member and project manager at CARP Strategies, Tanya Marinas, to, Tanya Marinas to kick us off. Tanya. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. We're so, so excited to have you today. So you're here for really a conversation, a local lens on governing. County executives are going to discuss navigating a health crisis, economic recovery, and really planning for the future. So first, I'd like to extend a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, a little bit about ABNY and the Young Professional community. So today's event is hosted by us, the ABNY Young Professionals. Um, we're really a community of young civic leaders. We're working across sectors with a shared drive to make New York a better place. And we're kind of everywhere. So we are your consultants, your lobbyists. We work in local government and state government um, in direct service organizations and nonprofits. It's because we really care about New York State. And what we do is we, we work to lead intimate and kind of unique conversations with thought leaders like the ones that we have today. Um, these are policy wonks and change makers um, and they'll take a few different forms. So they can be like ABNY talks, policy briefs, ABNY university, um, and those will be for particularly complex policies. Um, and then we'll also do kind of in-depth interviews and panel discussions, often in uncommon settings, like our famous What's on Tap series in bars or uh, at restaurants for our dinner discussions. And we also have tours, um, volunteer events, and so, so much more. It's an incredible, an incredible network, and I'm so happy to be a part of it. Um, and now, because you're here, you're a part of our network. Um, and if you've never been to one of our events, we are so glad you're here. Um, and if you're excited about us, please let us know. We have a few spots opening up soon. Um, and follow us on um, a, at A Better New York on social media. We keep everything current um, and we're able to provide content just like this. So again, a little bit about myself now. Um, my name is Tanya Marinos. I'm a proud Abney Young professional member. Um, I sit on the steering committee. Um, and two subcommittees where essentially we spend all of our time figuring out how to make events like this impactful and bring them to you. Who needs to be at the table? How do we open this up to a larger audience? Um, when I'm not working with ABNY, you know, in my free time, I'm a full-time project manager with CARP Strategies and we're a community and economic development consulting firm. Um, we're urban planners at heart and we work across the Northeast to help leaders build really stronger communities um, economies and cities. So this conversation is near and dear to me. Um, and we often work with municipalities and counties to develop kind of informed solutions to a number of problems, uh, real estate policy, infrastructure, resiliency, you name it. Um, one thing that's super important for us right now for all of us here is engaging communities in the COVID realm and understanding who can engage virtually and who can't, how do we connect with them? And so that's something that I'm, I'm working on all the time. And, you know, finally, we're here to really hear from this powerhouse of panelists. Um, they are from three different counties um, in New York State. Um, we really want to hear about um, their perspectives on county governance, pandemic response and recovery, um, inclusivity and equitable growth, and regional strategies for attracting and retaining talent. And during 2021, can't believe it's already almost the end of January 2021. Um, I'd love to introduce you to our panelists. They join us from Dutchess County in the Hudson Valley, Nassau County on Long Island, and Westchester County just north of the Bronx. These are our neighbors and our peers, and you know we have so much to learn from them. First panelist is Laura Curran, County Executive um, with Nassau County. Um, she became the first woman to hold office to hold that office in 2018. She represents more than 1.3 million residents and has prioritized really restoring trust and fiscal integrity to Nassau County government, uh, long plagued by corruption and deficits, her words, not mine. Um, the County Executive Curran also successfully advocated for new economic development and downtown revitalization projects with a focus on jobs, housing and transportation oriented development. After the pandemic hit Nassau County, she led the county's response to protect and inform residents um, while maintaining essential county operations and advocating for small businesses and schools. As the pandemic led to unprecedented challenges and change, County Executive Curran tirelessly advocated for Nassau County's residents and businesses providing decisive leadership while protecting residents' health and safety. Our next, uh, our next panelist 
County Executive George Latimer is a third generation Westchester County native, born and educated in Mount Vernon and currently living in Rye. Uh, County Executive Latimer took office in January 2018. Um, County Executive Latimer comes from a legacy of public service and has been you know, in a number of public service roles for the past 33 years. Uh, in his, the first half of his term as County Executive, he made great strides placing a renewed focus on the county's finances, protecting works, defending our environment and cutting the, the county tax levy by a million dollars. Um, we're looking forward to a conversation with Count, um, County Executive Latimer. And our final panelist is Marcus J. Molinaro, uh, who was elected to Dutchess County's seventh county as Dutchess County's seventh county executive in November, 2011. Um, at 36, County Executive Molinaro took office as the youngest county executive in history, in county history, I should say. Um, he was reelected for a third term in 2019 um, and has been uh, elected to public office at the age of 18 um, in 1994. In 1995, he became the youngest mayor in the United States. Thank you for, for being here with us. Um, in 2006, he brought his passion for public service to Albany when elected to represent the 103rd district in the New York State Assembly. Here as county executive, he serves as the second vice president to the New York State Association of Counties and is on the board of directors. Um, County Executive Molinaro has been an innovator in New York, establishing a holistic approach to really dealing with residents' health. Um, by combining the former departments of health and mental hygiene into the Department of Behavioral and Community Health, County Executive Molinaro focused on population health in Dutchess County, looking at the health of the whole person, both in the physical and mental health to really best serve their needs. Um, and last but not least, Moderating today's discussion is Queensboro President Donovan Richards Jr., who is a lifelong resident of Southeast Queens and was elected to his title in November 2020. So we're happy to have you here as well. Um, uh, Queensboro President uh, Richards is a fighter for affordable housing and has served on the chair of the subcommittee of zoning and franchises in his first city council term. Borough President Richards ha has also chaired the Committee on Environmental Protection following Superstorm Sandy and most recently chaired the Committee on Public Safety. Um, as Queensboro President, he is leading the efforts to revitalize the borough and make it one which works for all of its residents and workers. And with that, I am done and I am so excited to pass it off to Borough President uh, Richards. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Melva. Melva's my constituent first, even before she's the CEO of Abney. So I just have to put that out there. <laughs> but uh, honored to be here and so proud of all the work she's doing and all the work that Abney is doing. And for all the young professionals on tonight, uh, to this afternoon, thank you for, for being here. So we're going to hop right into this uh, and try to make this as lively as possible. Um, so let's start off with, uh, I'm going to start off with Nassau County Executive Laura Curran, because I believe in ladies first. Um, and we're going to kick this off by asking, as we begin to think about economic recovery from the pandemic, what do you see as ways to bounce back and restore the economy in your counties? One thing I think uh, we really need to do is, is, is appreciate and understand the value of our businesses, uh, especially our small businesses. Most people in Nassau County are employed by small business. Uh, they're the, you know, the, the, the cliches, the fabric, the backbone. The bottom line is they're the ones who are employing people, who are creating revenue, creating excitement. And the more that we can help them and empower them, give them the tools they need to succeed during this very difficult time and understand and trust that they want to keep their employees safe. They want to keep their customers safe and help them do that. I think that will go a very, very long way. Um, my other passion, of course, is infrastructure. And the great thing about infrastructure is everybody likes it. Republicans, Democrats, you know, you name it, local, federal. Uh, we have 12 shovel ready projects. Uh, we are working with our federal partners. I know there's stimulus coming. Infrastructure stimulus, I think, is the most effective kind of stimulus because it puts people to work. It gets money moving in the economy quickly and it builds stuff, stuff that we need, improving our roads so people can get to work more easily, so goods can be um, brought to stores more easily, uh, improves the quality of life and, uh, you know, gets money, as I say, in the economy, gets people to work. So um, I, I am very optimistic about our future. I think uh, done well, we can recover quickly and get back to normal. 
Great, thank you for that. We're gonna go now to County Executive Malinaro and then following him, uh, we've been also joined by County Executive Latimer, Latimer so we'll hear from him following uh, County Executive Malinaro. Well, listen, on the economic uh, recovery front, uh, I think Laura frames it pretty well. Uh, the, the small business network uh, really has kept our people employed. And what, what's been remarkable is even those that saw significant, um, obviously, impact because of closures and, and even just the, the reality of working in this new environment, you know, many of our small businesses kept people employed even when they couldn't afford it. I mean, they tapped their own bank accounts. They drew, they drew, drew, drew down their savings accounts to keep their neighbors employed. So the real value of that small business network um, has never been on greater display, but it's also never been frayed as much. And, and really for a couple of reasons, right? The financial impact. So, you know, we're all continuing to, to push Republican and Democrat, the federal government and the state government to provide the, the right amount of relief for small businesses uh, to, to, to re-engage, to stay open and to expand. The other though is, you know, uh, this investment in infrastructure as, as part of economic recovery for us, it is really balanced on a couple of things. One is it, the, the infrastructure that we need, in particular uh, upstate, what, I should say upstate, we're at the northern end of, of the metropolitan area. Um, the, the infrastructure we need the most is water sewer uh, infrastructure because it drives down costs and allows for density development in and around village centers, in and around transportation hubs. And knowing that so many employees, in particular, uh, those who may have formerly worked in the city, need to have access uh, to, uh, uh, to to the resources locally and still be able to commute in and out, that's the infrastructure uh, that we have to focus on. But also we learned uh, this last uh, uh, 12 months, the real challenge that people have with accessing broadband, high-speed internet and, and the technology necessary to support a new economy. And there's no question, we have a new economy. More people will work out of the office, more small businesses will have to equip themselves for that kind of marketplace even as we restore and return to normalcy. So, you know, our focus, I, I think, has got to be supporting those that, that really struggle the hardest, those that small business, 70% of new jobs created by small businesses, and investing, I think, state, federal, local resources on building the uh, holistic infrastructure necessary uh, to keep people working. Thank you for that, uh, Executive Malinaro. We're now going to go to County Executive Vladimir. Uh, and the, the question I pose is, as we uh, begin to think about economic recovery from the pandemic, what do you see as ways to bounce back and restore the economy in your counties? And also, let me just give a fun fact that borough presidents are county executives as well. So I'm the Queens County executive. Um, no offense to my friends in Long Island. Uh, <laughs> but we'll go to you now, uh, County Executive Latimer. Thanks very much. And uh, I'm very happy to be with my colleagues, Mark Molinaro and Laura Curran, and uh, your colleague, Ruben Diaz, and I go back, uh, as was Mark, to the time of the State Assembly together. We always have that Bronx Westchester thing going on since we're <laughs> side by side neighbors. You know, I think it's important, certainly from a Westchester perspective, is to see the, the health of our county as tied into the health of the counties north of us. Mark and Rockland and Orange and Dutchess County, uh, Putnam counties, and also the health of New York City. Uh, while we have a dotted line, div dividing line between us in the Bronx and us in Putnam County, the general economic health uh, really is something that happens regionally. And and I've I've even said in our um, in our world, other than the fact that Laura and her colleague Steve Ballone root for the New York Islanders, and I root for the New York Rangers, we have much more in common and the health of Long Island is also helpful to the Hudson Valley as well, because it's a region that people are making business decisions on. If they stay in the region, they're looking at the advantages of uh, uh, transportation hubs. And I think the restoration of uh, Metro North and I guess the Long Island Railroad as well is essential to our health going forward. There are gonna be some people who will be officed in White Plains and will not return to the city, but the city will rebound. And when they do, having those transportation structures are gonna be important because one of Westchester's great advantage in competing for the residential population is our easy commute into the city. And, and when you look at uh, the Hudson River as a, as a linkage from tourism and a host of other areas, what happens in Dutchess County, Orange, Rockland matters to us as well. So I think a holistic view of economic development is the wise view. And, uh, and I think Mark said it very accurately, uh, our political affiliation isn't as important as our common commitment to incentivizing uh, these things. Now, we, uh, we received some Coronavirus Cares Act money uh, in our county, and uh, we used quite a bit of it to help support small businesses. 
We took $10 million to uh, deal with grants, not loans, but grants for those businesses that uh, needed it. And it helped, you know, it helped some businesses survive. You know, the restaurant was able to buy some outdoor heaters and extend their restaurant season into November. And uh, some of the retail, the small retails, were able to buy the plexiglass that they needed to, you know, protect their customers and their workers at the point of sale. And so things that happened that, that might have been without that, the business might not have survived that I think helped go forward. When we look for how we're going to, to move forward on that, we certainly believe, you know, our taxation policy is part of that. In our county, we've cut property taxes the last two years. We were able to do it. Not everybody can do it all the time. We may not be able to do it over an extended period of time, but we felt that that was a helpful step in the right direction. And we've also had a very aggressive strategy with the major business associations in our county, the Westchester County Association and the Business Council of Westchester, and as well, <clears throat> the many Chamber of Commerce entities that we have who are really in the business of marketing all those local downtowns. And, and I don't ever underestimate when a person comes to uh, uh, Armonk or Larchmont or any of these communities in our county, they're not necessarily buying into Westchester County, they're buying into Armonk or Larchmont or Hastings. And we have to make sure we emphasize that. So I think, uh, you know, this kind of uh, holistic way of uh, repositioning ourselves and marketing ourselves will help all of us. And the rising tide is gonna raise all boats. Great, let's stay there for a second. I wanna, I wanna hop into, cause you, you gave a lot of good food for thought, all of you did. And I wanna move on to tourism a little bit. You know, how have the travel restrictions and precautions affected local tourism to your counties? Um, a good example of that, New York is traveling to beaches of Nassau County or upstate the towns of Dutchess County. I'm interested to know, you know, how have travel restrictions impacted your economy? I'll, you mind? I'll jump. I'll jump yeah. first. Uh, just to say, I, you know, so so tourism has always been uh, uh, collectively the largest employer in in Dutchess County, largest industry cluster, especially when you include agritourism, agricultural tourism. So interestingly, early on in the pandemic, uh, restrictions and just just people's obviously desire not to not to travel had an immediate significant impact, right? Because most of our uh, spring and summer um, uh, uh, business outside of, of residence alone is, is traditional tourism. But interestingly in Dutch, and so, so we saw significant um, impact to businesses and, and also significant revenue losses. But interestingly, Dutchess County, um, our, and this is maybe slightly different than, than certainly um, uh, the, the farther ends of Long Island, but our tourists are generally day tourists. They're generally folks who go someplace else, New York City or from New York City, and they'll come up for a day. And so, yes, we saw the immediate impact to hotels and to restaurants. And that, that closed and shuttered a lot of businesses, no question. And for those businesses, it, is, it, it, you know, it, it, it was devastating. But as the restrictions were lifted and we, we have sort of a, you know, just a different understanding of the virus and a more, I'll say, a little more comfort level in, in, in making around, our tourism industry bounced back a little bit and almost resembles, I'll say, what we were experiencing early on because we we didn't have and we don't have in this in this region the week long vacation. You're not coming to Dutchess County for three or four days. You're generally doing it for a day or two and you're generally associating it with some other trip. So for us, um, you know, the staycation for you, uh, Mr. Borough President, was likely to the FDR or to the Culinary Institute or to uh, Franklin Delano. Roosevelt Home and Library, or to a farm, uh, pick your own in, in Dutchess uh, or the Mid Hudson Valley. So, so I just would say that, that, that and, and from that end, tourism provides us a really good opportunity to rebrand, right? It's the marketing of our communities. It gives us an opportunity to shine a light on businesses again, in particular small businesses, because we're, we're telling the story of those businesses. But also uh, in this new environment, uh, tourism can be that much more agile. And so hopefully we don't go back, we don't backslide with restrictions. But right now, the initial hit was deep, it was hard, and it was hurtful, but the rebound is actually, in the tourism industry, has actually been pretty astonishing, and, and we've been able to sort of capture uh, a new energy, pent up desire of people just to, you know, just to go, they may even want to visit their mother-in-law, that's how much they're interested in just taking a day out uh, to, <laughs> to this end of, uh, <laughs> to the region. And can I say this, uh, just to all of you, um, you know, as a former Yonkers boy, I think you have some appreciation for the Westchester Bronx, and then, uh, you know, uh, a continuing South uh, relationship that we all share. Yeah, I'll I'll jump in there. I I, I second that emotion um, on Long Island. So you know we'll go up to upstate, what we call upstate, whether it's the Catskills or Dutchess County. I love the Culinary Institute, 
Um, and I and I see a lot of, you know, city slickers up there as well going for hikes. So so that's good. You know, when to leave New York State, you got to quarantine. It's a whole rigmarole. Now, in, you know, Long Island, people come, they stay. Tourism is huge. And so, of course, thousands of jobs were lost or furloughed or, or furloughed or delayed. So it, it's been very, very tough. So we've been really pushing our parks, our beaches, our gems. Um, and just to give you one example, it's it's worked. Uh, Nickerson Beach, which is a county run beach, had more than twice the amount of visitors than it did in 2019, in 2020, than it did in 2019, even at 50% capacity. So, uh, and at the beginning, I don't know if you remember this, but the uh, beautiful private gardens, those nonprofit gardens, you know, those old North Shore mansions with the gardens, those couldn't open. And uh, I saw this as, while our public parks could open, I was really pushing for the reopening of these beautiful wide open spaces where people could enjoy the springtime and the flowers and the trees and the weather. And P.S., what a better place to social distance. And then I don't know if you remember this at the beginning of the pandemic, golf was allowed and it wasn't allowed and it was allowed and it wasn't allowed. And I, I said, come on, open golf because it is perfect for social distancing. People need to get out of the house. And here we are on this beautiful island with fabulous golf courses, public and private. Uh, let's take advantage of it. Um, so we also partnered with Discover Long Island, which is a, a bi-county, it's a nonprofit group that works with both counties in promoting tourism. And we really emphasized our downtowns. When people could go out to eat again, we did special deals for restaurants uh, that joined this. There's an app that you could download and it brought more people to our local businesses, brought more people to our downtowns. And you know, the argument was, you got to eat. They need to work. Let's bring it together and make it work for everyone. So in any way that we could push what we already have, um, it really did help us get to the other side of a really difficult time. And we'll go to County Executive Latimer now. Yeah, I, you are the envy of New York City because Long Island has inside, di inside dining. And uh, by the way, we're encouraging that. folks to just come on over the border. It's indoor dining. It's 50% capacity. It's safe. Come on and get, you know, you know you like our pizza. We're offering, by the way, going free. Just come on, Governor. Free. Come on, Governor. <laughs> cross, the, uh, cross the Fox Neck Bridge and then we'll compete for the dollar. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, obviously we're all, you know, basically singing from the same hymnal. Uh, but what Mark touched on, it's certainly true in the Hudson Valley, and I assume it's true on the island as well. It's very analogous to whenever I've made a vacation trip or even a business trip with some personal time attached to San Francisco. San Francisco is a gorgeous city and it can compel your attention. But you almost always take a day and go up the Napa Valley to the wine country and you do a picnic up there. Or you might go south down to Monterey Bay, Santa Cruz, and that area. And it, it's tied into the San Francisco experience if you're there for a week. And the same is true of coming to some of the sites that we have. Uh, we've talked about just let's let's go out and see the Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh, head, uh, headquarters, uh, his uh, home site in Sacramore Hill. Or let's go up to see Hyde Park where Franklin Roosevelt is. And that's a very natural thing for us to do in Westchester. And those are wonderful historical sites. I, so it goes back, I think, to what I said a second ago. The, uh, the success of New York City, the health of New York City, directly affects the health of the suburbs. And I know there's, there's always the sense of, you know, the suburbs and the city are at counterpoint. On some things we are. But in some things, the more international travel comes back into New York and feels comfortable with New York, the more New York has dining options that says, let's go to New York for a week and let's see a Broadway play, then that opens the door for them to say, let's go up the Hudson Valley, or for that matter, let's go out to the island and then pull in some of these things. We have some sites that are worthwhile as part of the, the, the time frame. Obviously, there are restrictions from the state right now. We have a, a wonderful amusement park at Playland run by the county. Laura and I had uh, brunch there with our uh, families uh, a couple of years ago. And, um, uh, but, but that can't be open during the pandemic until we get clearance to do that and so forth. And the same would be true of some of our, uh, or some of our other sites that we have. We have historical homesteads, Caramore, and things of that nature. So I do think that, that tourism is, is a very um, effective way for us to get people to realize, yes, Nassau County, Suffolk County, Westchester, Putnam, Dutchess, Rockland, we're open. We're not closed. And of course, they're always the greatest laugh that we have. And, and I did my graduate work at NYU, worked in the Bronx and commuted down to uh, Washington Square. I had classmates who said, where do you live? And I'd say, you know, the town I lived in, Westchester County, they'd say, oh, you're upstate. 
you know, because upstate to them was something north of Fordham Road in the Bronx. And, and the, the proximity, and I'll speak on behalf of my colleagues, the proximity of going to Hyde Park or to Sagamore Hill or to Caramore in Westchester is so nearby that the benefit of it is tremendous. So the more tourism comes into New York City, the more we outside of New York City with our own unique attractions, our own unique reason to be there, I think can capitalize on it. And again, it's a regional win for all of us together. Yeah, and, and let's um, let's stay with you for for another second. Um, and you know, obviously, to, in order to get the economy moving again, you know, I think there were a lot of learning lessons from the beginning of this pandemic. And I know that Westchester County, for instance, was the site of the first COVID nineteen um, epicenter in the nation. What lessons can other parts of New York State and other cities across the U.S. learn from New Rochelle's experience? Well, I think what happened to us was going to happen somewhere, and somebody was going to have to learn the very first stages of how contagious this disease was. So we had our first case identified on March 3rd, and then before we knew it, we had 100 cases and we had 1,000 cases. And our population is less than Nassau, Suffolk, and the city, and we jumped right out in front in terms of total number of cases. Over time, population became the, the basic factor for, for number of, of infections. What we learned, first of all, is, and I think we learned this positively, is that we had to work in partnership between the municipality, the city of New Rochelle, <clears throat> excuse me, the county, which has a health department function and the state. And the fact that within the week, we were interacting with the state and of course the city, the mayor, Noam Gramson, the, all of these mayors and supervisors of people in each of our counties that we deal with all the time. We develop close personal relationships. We sit down, we meet, you know, or, you know the day that it happened, and what are you going to do? What are we going to do? How can we contribute resources? That helped keep it at a more manageable level because it could have spiraled out much faster than it did and much worse than it did. As bad as it was, it could have been worse. We also realized that uh, when something like this happens, we absolutely have to have the support of the federal government. Uh, the federal government resources to get us PPE. We don't produce PPE in our county. There was no way for us to uh, have the, the buying leverage to provide that on a regular basis. So to be able to go ultimately through the state, but to the federal government and to have the federal government stand behind us and recognize that these resources would come in. Uh, we had to have excellent communications with our population because the fear factor was tremendous. And, and not knowing the disease in the first few weeks, you know, people thought that it was attached to the geography, that somehow it was in the very streets of the community that you're in, when in fact, it, it was being conveyed between people who were in a certain social circle, in this particular case, people who had a common religious uh, attachment to a facility where the person first gotten a uh, virus. And so there's a lot of misbeliefs that we had to cut out of the way as we went through this. Um, we, uh, we, we came to say that we were the first, but we weren't the worst. And I think many folks around the country, you know, really didn't see the message of what happened, not just in Westchester, but in New York. And, and there are many places in this country that said, oh, that's a New York problem. They got a lot of people up there. That's not going to hit me in rural, pick a state, rural Oklahoma. Well, what we found out is that it's going to be everywhere and our ability to be ready for it with the proper PPE, the proper uh, uh, attitude, I think has helped us through it. And uh, now as we face an increased surge again through uh, December, January, I think we've been better prepared for it. Uh, and we have not in our county and, and we're linked with Mark and the regional structure that the governor has created. Uh, with all of the stress that we've had, we have not exceeded the amount of hospital beds that we need to have. And that gives us some confidence that we can get through this. Thank you. And I wanna to go to you, uh, County Executive Laura Curran now. Let's talk about uh, the distribution of the vaccine. And obviously there's been a, a conversation around equity when it comes to the distribution and who's taking the vaccine. Um, how has the rollout of the vaccine uh, gone in your respective county? Do you currently have the supplies to meet the demand? And I know you just spoke about the federal government and we've seen uh, our new president, not thank God, uh, order up some new, uh, uh, a lot more uh, vaccines for, for states. So how's, how's it going in, in your county? So we know that supply is much, much less than demand. We have a population of 1.3 million people. So that means hundreds of thousands of people in our county are eligible. The, vac the, the supply is not coming anywhere near to the demand right now. Uh, we are ready to scale up. Our Department of Health 
is now running two points of distribution POD pods. Uh, we are, we have not, if every dose that we've gotten at our Department of Health, we've administered 100% of those doses. We have not thrown one dose away. We also haven't had to cancel appointments because we're not going to make appointments available unless we have vaccine in hand because we know that it has not been, the numbers have not been reliable yet. So we're ready to scale up. Our hospital partners are ready to scale up. Pharmacies, we're ready to go. We just need the supply. And we, you know, we know the supply chain. The, manufacturer, man, the, the pharmaceutical manufacturers have to make the stuff. It goes federal government, state government, and then down to us. So I know everyone's doing their best at every one of those levels. Uh, we need more vaccine. I'm, I'm really optimistic about what I'm hearing about this new Johnson & Johnson vaccine coming. Um, I hear we're going to be, according to Dr. Fauci, we're going to be getting approval within two weeks. And then it's a one dose one. It doesn't need that deep refrigeration. I think that will be a game changer. So that makes me very optimistic. So we're ready to scale up uh, and, and then get everyone who wants it, who's eligible, vaccinated. Now, you, now um, Borough President Richards, you spoke about, about equity, and that's something that we take very, very seriously. So we have um, folks who are on the equity task force from our county government and other stakeholders as well. On Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we had a pop-up event at a church in Hempstead, at a black church in Hempstead, where we prioritize seniors in the community. Uh, people who may not be able to be trying to make an appointment and refresh their browser every two seconds. You know, people who might be hard to reach, who have transportation issues. So we're ready to scale that kind of operation up as well to make sure that everyone who wants it, who is eligible, has access. It's very important. And it's the key to getting us back to normal. The vaccination is the, our passport to the land of normal. County Executive Malinaro, can you speak to equity and how has it been in your county and uh, what are you doing and do you have enough uh, enough supply at this moment? <laughs> well, the last question is easy to answer. No, uh, we don't. Uh, I think that the universal uh, uh, comment uh, nationwide is that, that uh, uh, certainly demand outpaces supply significantly. But I, I, I do want to say this um, and, and, and maybe being I'm inclined a little bit more to, to, to at least offer this, just that, I mean, first of all, keep in mind that, that outside of the city of New York, the distribution of vaccines, uh, who's, who's qualified, who's eligible, and how we do that is really dictated by the state government. And, and so we're functioning within rules that the state uh, creates. Now, to some degree, New York City is as well, but much broader access, although, although great frustration, but still much broader access in the city than, than, than in the counties that, that surround it. So that is an, a source of frustration. County governments by law are, are in fact the entities in, in the state of New York that are supposed to be leading the mass vaccination charge. I will say for whatever reason, uh, the state didn't activate the county vaccination, vaccination plans, although they're coming back to it. I think the, the realization that relying only on the hospitals as a central distribution point um, you know, has its limits and therefore uh, you're seeing counties, I think, being leaned on more by the state. But the bottom line is there just aren't enough doses. So yes, like Laura, our county uh, is prepared to scale up. I'm sure George will say the same thing. We can do thousands upon thousands of doses every single week. This week, the state uh, provided us 600 doses. Uh, the federal government went from providing 300,000 uh, doses, which is insufficient, to the state of New York to only 250,000 doses insufficient. So the promise here, I think, is good. The Biden administration has now said two things that are, that are music to our ears, but more importantly, bring real hope to people. One, increase uh, distribution. Just growing the numbers that come from the federal government to the state helps us solve some of that distribution problem. But secondly, and I think as importantly, the ability to plan several weeks out we couldn't do that. So I laughed and, and I, you know that I'm not the same party affiliation as my colleagues, but I laughed when the former secretary said, uh, oh, well, you know, they're, they're not gonna be, we're, we're already doing a million. Give me a break. We don't even know what you were doing to be able to measurement. You can't just say that. I mean, that's, that's not, not factual. So, so being able to project future weeks, showing the growth in the, in, the, in the numbers will help us. But I will say every county, no matter who uh, leads it, has the infrastructure in place, in particular, uh, to your, your question, to be able to equitably distribute. We have the networks with pharmacies, with churches, with, with, uh, with healthcare clinics to get to underserved populations. And in my community, underserved populations, I say respectfully to you, Mr. President, are, are, are neighbors that look a little bit like you, right? 
but also isolated neighborhoods that don't have access to, to, to health care. And they look a hell of a lot more like me, but they don't have the access to a health care provider. So we we are that connection and we're prepared to do it. And I'd, I'd end also by saying we also are the entities that have the relationships with congregate care settings. So whether you're a homebound senior or someone with a developmental disability, we have the capacity to go out into the community to provide those vaccines. And we're doing it. We have the equity task forces. We're all engaged and ready when the flip, uh, when the switch flips. If I would say this though, uh, the Johnson Johnson dose, uh, and I say this, uh, uh, and I agree with Laura, is, is promising. One of the things we're gonna have to engage in though is another kind of education process because it is a different kind of vaccine. It's the more traditional. The Johnson & Johnson single dose looks more like something you and I know uh, or would take as, with, as the flu, flu shot. We've just been ex educating folks about what messenger RNA is. We're gonna have to remind them that in fact, taking the Johnson & Johnson shot doesn't mean that you're gonna catch COVID, but it is a lesson and, a, and, and something we're gonna have to explain to folks because they have the, the flu shot mentality. So, so we, we have to ramp up that outreach to, to have folks uh, uh, educated, communicating, and then once we get more doses, we have the network to get to the communities and the and the neighborhoods that need access. We're ready to go. County Executive Letterman, do you wanna, do you wanna yeah. sign? Yeah, on? I think uh, we've spent the last uh, week to 10 days as an executive team in Westchester identifying where we would have additional large vaccination centers and then where we would have smaller um, period of time uh, centers that would be open for week to weeks and in, the, and in the four corners of our county. We have a large population of people of color uh, we have the city of Yonkers, 200,000 people, city of New Rochelle, 80,000 people, uh, Mount Vernon, Peekskill, uh, village of Port Chester, a very large village. In every one of those communities, we have significant populations of uh, folks who are black, folks who are uh, Latinx. And uh, we know that it's it, that one part of getting this uh, vaccination out is to make it accessible and easy, someplace close by where you live so you can get it. There is a completely different challenge, which we've already identified. Mm -hmm. And we've been in the process of developing uh, videos, public service videos in Spanish as well as English and uh, putting people in those videos who are credible spokespeople within the different communities. People who you know, are the same ethnic background might have uh, some of the same concerns because that's what it's gonna take to convince people, not you know, the politician who's the county executive, but a person they know, the minister in their neighborhood, the uh, community activist in their neighborhood to try to help people um, understand how important it is to do this. And I recognize coming out of a corporate career in marketing and sales, we have to convince people. We can't lecture people. We can't look down on them from some position on high. They're not gonna accept that. They're gonna have to be uh, convinced based on what their fears are or overcome those fears and then make it easy for them to get the vaccine in as reasonable a place as possible. Uh, just a quick anecdote. I have a personal friend of mine not involved in government or politics. And when we talked about the vaccine a couple of weeks ago, he said, are you going to get the vaccine? And I said, yeah, well, when my cohort uh, comes up, I certainly will. And he says, well, how do you know what's in it? And I said, well, when you eat a hot dog, do you know what's in it? When you eat a Pop-Tart, do you know what's in it? You're, 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 you're making me feel like I should be afraid of something because you don't, do you not trust the medical science? Because you trust the medical science for your annual flu shot. And, and in that kind of a humorous give and take comes part of what has to happen to break down the the barriers, because I think Laura said this, and I'll just repeat it. There is no other way out of this. There's no other way out of this. You can mask and social distance for years, and this, vac and this virus will still be with us at some level. The vaccine offers the hope that this is the way out. When enough of us take the vaccine, then we won't get the disease, and then we can get back to the economics, which you know drives the original question. And sometimes you just have to say that way. You have to get over your fear. We're a nation right now that sometimes responds to our fears more than our hopes. And we have to try to get that narrative in a different direction. For the record, there's a lot of carbs in, uh, in Pop-Tarts. So. There is. <laughs> my, uh, my waistline can attest to that. <laughs> um, let's go to you, uh, Executive Molinaro. Um, so last week we had a change in leadership in Washington, notably including the first Senate majority leader from New York State. Senator Charles E. Schumer, how do you plan to work with uh, this new administration? What issues do you hope that uh, will be addressed, uh, which would could benefit your county? Well, I'll, I'll you start. can answer that question. Are you happy about <laughs> this leadership change? Yeah, and and so I listen. We we welcome uh, the uh, certainly addition. Uh, uh, I, I think that President. First, I'll start with. I mean, President Biden 
uh, has, has uh, uh, long stated his support in particular for state and local assistance. Uh, I'll say financially, I did notice in the chat, one of the questions regarding was uh, no, was sort of government services. Don't go to the chat questions. We're going to go there. No, no, I won't. But I, just, <laughs> I, I, like, I read everything. Um, but but to that point, and, as, and, and, and it's a good point to, to reference, I mean, uh, both uh, the president and Senator Schumer have been spearheading an effort to get state and local aid. We need that assistance. Never before in the history of America has the federal government left its local governments to fend for themselves in an, in an, in an emergency. And I'll tell you, quite frankly, uh, it, it, it was uh, the political cowardice, I think, of Republican major the Republican majority in the U.S. Senate that we are that they blocked uh, state and federal aid. Period. There is no other. They, they believed that it wasn't something they could go to their checkbook for. Uh, that said, we hope that changes. We expect that it will. Uh, Senator Schumer has been a great partner uh, to Republicans and Democrats across the state. We're, we're obviously looking forward to that relationship. I'll go back to what uh, what Laura offered. I think that one of the the best opportunities for all of us, there is near unanimity on this, is infrastructure investment. And 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 not only the, the fact that it creates jobs, but it helps build communities. I mean, if I have water, sewer, and 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 broadband, I can build up village centers, city centers, I can I can get resources to underserved populations, I can help connect communities that aren't connected today. So so we so so I'd offer going back to the, the new president, if the message and the goal for all of us, and it ought to be a focus. Um, on unity, unity means trust. Trust means truth. Truth means you've got to, you got to, you got to sort of uh, leave your egos to the side. If that's the focus, from a government function, state and local aid helps because that's everybody trying to trying to provide services, and infrastructure helps because everybody everybody needs a road. Everybody needs to pick up their phone and make a call. Everyone needs access to the internet, libraries, school kids, uh, young and old, black and white, gay and straight, all need those basic services. And we, especially at our level, <clears throat> try to get the job done. Give us a few million dollars, we'll pave a street, we'll fix a sidewalk, we'll invest in water and sewer. But I think that there's a, there, that's what we hope for and expect and think it's going to happen. But the added bonus of that is it puts into practice in a competent way uh, the message of unity. And I think that uh, now more than ever, that, uh, that is a, uh, it's a powerful thing and will likely get us all uh, you know, uh, working together toward, uh, toward achieving some success. Go to County Executive Laura Parent on that as well. I'll just say amen again to infrastructure, 100%. Uh, it's a crowd pleaser and it's great for the economy. So I am, you know, it, it, I think it's very good for us that the majority leader is, is a New Yorker. I know he's a fighter, he's a hard worker, and that he will deliver for his home state. Um, I would also add amen to, um, I am hopeful and confident that the vaccine plan will mean more vaccine coming to us, really ramping that up and, and having it be a very systematic program of getting this out to states so that the states can get it to us. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the SALT deduction. Uh, it would be great if we could make that right. I'm gonna make that number three on my list. So in, actually vaccine, infrastructure, SALT. Uh, we, uh, in Nassau County, we have very high property taxes and uh, this is really our families, a lot of our homeowners. So uh, I'm looking forward to some work on that as well. But, you know, one thing that I want to say, it, it's been an emotionally exhausting year for our country, for our world. And I feel that at the local level, and I wonder if my fellow county executives uh, agree with me, we're really on the county level, on the front lines of dealing with real things. We're the ones that with the health departments that do the contact tracing. We're the ones that are in charge of paving the roads. We have the Office of Emergency Management dealing with pandemic planning. Uh, we're the ones with the ME and all of that. So we're dealing with real things. And I feel that a big part of our job at the local level with the craziness and the you know stuff swirling around in Washington, that we can be sort of the voice of calm reassurance that we got you, we're gonna keep you, we're gonna do everything we can to keep you safe. Um, and I think that's a message that has really come through through this pandemic, the importance of local government, because there's a lot of drama on the, on the federal level. County Executive Latimer, if you wanna chime in on that as well. Yeah, you know, I, I think my colleagues have really, uh, you know, touched on the major policy areas. I obviously have great respect for Chuck Schumer. Uh, I think he's certainly gonna be very good for us in, in New York state because he understands our needs. <clears throat> and, and while he's represented us for a long time, he's, he's omnipresent. We see him and interact with him on a regular basis. But, you know, I, I also think that, and, and I build 
in terms of our experiences. Um, my experience in government, I've had a number of different positions before I became county executive. I've seen the value of working cooperatively across party lines. Uh, Mark and myself and three other county executives just signed off on an arrangement for high school sports. And uh, my colleagues, Ed Day, Mary Ellen O'Dell, Steve Newhouse, they're Republicans, I'm a Democrat, Pat Ryan's a Democrat, but we found common ground on something that, as Laura just said, is local and necessary and important. And I think there's more of that we can find. I want, I want to give a compliment, because we're talking about the role of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the local government. I want to give a compliment to somebody you might think I would never compliment. President Richard Nixon. For all of the things that President Nixon has been written about and you know the great issue of his day, he redefined federalism in a way that as I look at it now, you know, many years later, I was a young man then, I'm not young now, uh, represented a way that the federal government could provide resources to the local governments and let the local governments through the block grant program determine how best to use them. And, and you know, running Duchess and running Nassau and running Westchester, they're different based on demography and topography and different things. I wouldn't think of trying to tell how my colleague from Erie County should use the money. You know, it should be something that becomes part of the give and take of government. And when Martin and I served in the state assembly together, we have our differences philosophically in certain ways, but, but we could find common ground. We could sit and have a cup of coffee and say on this particular bill, there's a way to get there. That's what I hope we can find in Washington. I don't know how easy it's gonna be this week or next week, but that's what people I think need to see. They know that we have principles that define us based on our political affiliations and some issues can be defined only by those philosophies. But even when we have divergent philosophies, we don't have to hate each other. And then on the areas of practical government operation, infrastructure, as both Laura and Mark have said, that's something where reasonable people can hammer this thing out and get to the final ground. And so if I'm preaching, you know, the interaction between suburban counties and the city, and I'm preaching within my own county, the benefit of having Republicans and Democrats lay the weapons down. Let's work together. Let's find a solution. <clears throat> I say that because I think that's what people want. When I talk to the, the regular person, not the person who's politically active, they hold their views. When I talk to the average regular person, they want access to a good job, or they want to be able to have lower taxes. They want to be able to have clean water. They want to have, as you'd say, infrastructure. They want to know the roads, the bridges they drive over are, are going to hold up, and they're going to, uh, you know, the whole system of life will allow them to live life the way they want to. And I think in local government, you do see that in an everyday basis. I think it's probably one of the reasons why Mark and I decided to say goodbye to uh, the state legislature and try our hand at a different level of uh, responsibilities. But I, I fundamentally think that is a unifying factor, Donovan, that can bring us together. That's what we desperately need. We need to find the common ground that we can all agree upon, not just the panel, but politics in general. And I think we can find that if we want to find it. And I think people want us to find that. Thank you, Sondra. That's a really great point. And, and Laura, you touched on this a little bit uh, earlier. Um, you started to go into it, but I wanted to, to ask, I guess, as we begin to try to close out, and then I want to get to a few questions, at least one or two from the public. Um, what lessons can city and state governments take away uh, from governance at a county level? So that's, a, that's she, she just a such an side. excellent question. <laughs> we, we're the ones charged with doing the work. We have to carry out the policies. So we might not always get to set it, but we've got to make it work. And I think, I think, I mean, I can certainly speak for, I don't know, I think, I think I can speak for all county executives, but I'm just going to do it anyway. I think the county executives in New York, and I've spoken to many, um, including including uh, Latimer and Malinero and everyone else in between and up, up north. We've had a lot of conversations and we really have been able to adapt, you know, uh, dealing with something that none of us would have planned. We think about disasters that can happen. This was maybe number 47 on the list of things to worry about. Um, and we've managed. We have our departments of health. We have our police departments. We have our office of, uh, offices of emergency management. We've done drills to prepare for this sort of thing in the past. Um, and we've been able to pivot. And as policy changes on the higher levels, we've been able to adapt and we've been able to make it work. And, and I think, you know, as I was saying before, I think regular people out there who don't really think much about government, they're just going about their day, um, really understand the importance of who's representing you on the local level. It really makes a bigger difference in your day-to-day -day life, whether there's a pandemic or not. 
who represents you on the local level than who represents you in the halls of Congress. And that's no disrespect to our Congress people who are wonderful. Um, we don't really have a lot of time to complain. We don't really have a lot of time to play politics and whine. We just have to get the job done because there's immediate accountability. Our residents will know if it's working or not within hours. I lost myself for a second. Anybody else want to chime in on that? I don't think, I think Laura summed it up. I will say this, I have been, uh, we have been blessed these last 12 months to have Republican and Democrat county leaders all across the state of New York who have set it all aside to just get the job done. It is, it is a really, I will say this, it is a remarkable feeling uh, to be surrounded by good, competent, quality people who are just honestly trying uh, to solve problems for the people they serve and adapt is a great, great, uh, great word to the to the challenges we face. I don't need to add to that. Uh, Laura, Laura said it well. All right. I just want to get to. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to. I'll add one sentence, which is a sentence that was told to me when I was a 29 year old marketing director by my boss. He looked at me. He pointed at me. He said, "Results matter," and I think results. We have a lot of symbolism. We say the things we say. Results matter. We get results. Focus on results. We'll come together much quicker. Yes, absolutely. I, I love I love ribbon cuttings and ground breakings myself. Um, so let's get to William White's question. Uh, he had a, a question in the chat. How do you think uh, How do you think about regional partnership and competition across state lines, particularly on issues like housing, where New Jersey has built at a faster rate than New York's suburbs in recent years? Good question. Oh, yeah. Can, uh, can I jump into that real quick? I'll yeah. just, I, I feel um, New Jersey has outperformed Long Island in housing and it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with the whole history of Long Island, but it's lots of towns, it's lots of villages, it's lots of restrictions, it's lots of zoning complications. It's hard to get things done. We know we need to do more kinds of housing at different price points, including affordable housing. If we wanna keep and retain young people which is more business because they want to go where the cool kids are. So the fact that we're being outperformed by New Jersey is an embarrassment and it's something that we're working to fix as much as we can, given the fact that we don't control zoning on the county level. That's where I want to jump into uh, follow what Laura said, because it's critical. The structure of government in New Jersey and the structure of government in New York are different. Uh, I have 45 municipalities and I think Laura's got more and Mark's got proportionally as many. Uh, I have cities, towns, and villages that control what happens in their bailiwick. We at the county level can incentivize through IDA funding. We allocate direct money for land acquisition, for infrastructure improvements. Uh, there are other ways that we can make things happen to help incentivize. But we basically draw up to a point at which home rule takes over and the village of XYZ or the town of uh, Q, you know, PQR is going to make the decision. And I think it's not so much that I, I want more power, but, but I think we need, if, if affordable housing is going to be a key priority, then there has to be some ability to break through some of those things, work with local concerns, but also work with them in a way that we can develop more affordable housing reasonably. And one more thing, the federal government, if we're going to help the poorest people in our area, we have plenty of them in Westchester, even though we have very wealthy people, we need assistance from the feds in Section 8. We cannot build affordable housing that reaches 30% of AMI on our own. We need subsidy that helps it. And, and that has to be a federal policy that says affordable housing is necessary and can be incentivized by that, that program. And I understand it's an expensive program, but that is the way we're going to reach the poorest of our people with affordable housing. Mark, do you want to chime in on that as well? I would just to say, and, and it's, being, it's being exacerbated now. I mean, with all due respect, and we love having uh, your neighbors uh, look, else, uh, look north and, and south uh, for new mm -hmm. homes. But frankly, uh, you're willing to pay a hell of a lot more money for homes uh, that you know, are basically entry level for, for our residents. So the, the market now is pushing at a, at a much more aggressive rate. I will offer, George and I actually, the very first forum we, we ever participated together as county executives was on housing, if you remember, George Pace. Mm -hmm, I do. But the entire housing subsidy, if you will, from federal to state is very siloed. So, so we can't create the integrated kind of uh, uh, development that you need. And, and so New Jersey does have a more integrated uh, delivery of housing. Uh, there also is, as, as I agree, we agree, I was former village mayor. Yeah, uh, home rule has made it very, very complicated, certainly outside of, outside of New York City, towns, villages, and cities. 
get to make those sort of localized decisions. But the funding structure and the support from federal and state agencies is still very siloed. So housing becomes very segmented. What we want is a housing ladder. I, I want everything in my village centers from the, the, the lowest, for the lowest of income to the highest. And now as cities are developing outside of, of New York City, they are, right? So Poughkeepsie, Kingston, Beacon, we have to be very, very careful, and we're already seeing it, uh, that we don't see the kind of investment that pushes uh, th those who have traditionally lived in communities affordably out. And so, so, so I would just offer to, to an agreement with my colleagues, we have to address the siloing of those state and federal programs so that we can really leverage development in and around village and city centers so that we, we create the housing ladder that's necessary uh, outside and, and throughout the state. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over now. I want to thank you all. Actually, before we close out, let's let's do something light. Um, uh, any books you're reading? Any any series you're watching on television? I mean, in any, well, any of first. your spare time, not that we have any of that, really. I'm, I have very young children. I can't speak for all my <laughs> colleagues, but that means that I am up very late because it's the only free time I have. Yeah. And so other than watching Blippi during the daytime, <laughs> uh, I, have, uh, I have covered The Crown. I love The Crown. I'm waiting for the next year. Okay. I just started The Queen's Gambit, but I will also say I'm reading, I've read, uh, I, I, I do want to say this because I really loved it. I finished, uh, I finished Hamilton some time ago. I jumped to John Adams by McCullough and now I'm reading uh, Washington. And it's really just a fabulous, and, and, and during the last several weeks, sadly, uh, it's been a real good reminder uh, of, of mm -hmm. both the struggle and, and the promise that was made those years ago. And, and, right, and by the way, a lot of deficiency, but an amazing, amazing uh, bringing together of brilliant minds and, and, and just reading that, that history is very, very, um, you know, very important, I think. Are you and, reading the Ron Chernow, Washington? Yeah, I am. It is, it's like 48 uh, chapters, 48 hours. Um, can I say this though? If you've, if, you've, if you've seen Hamilton, the play, you certainly know Hamilton's, uh, um, uh, um, uh, he had the relationship, uh, uh, I can't remember her name, but in the, in the Chernow book, uh, there's a lot of New York references on Hamilton, right? A lot of New York references. The one Dutchess County, clear Dutchess County resident is, uh, the only thing we know about, I forget her name, uh, his- uh, Mariah? Mariah. And the only thing we know about her is that she was unstable and came from Dutchess County. <laughs> <laughs> That's your claim to fame. That's right. Well, no, the, the Constitution was ratified in the building next to mine, right here on Market Street in Poughkeepsie. So I just offered wow, that. Wow, that's great. <laughs> so good. I love The Queen's Gambit. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and books, it's so funny. I used to love fiction, but I've been reading a lot of biographies. So I just read this big tome about Churchill, which was fantastic, called Walking with Destiny. And now I'm reading another huge one, uh, The Power Broker about oh, Robert uh, Moses, yeah, which is I'm just blowing my mind together. every yeah. night. It's like fascinating. As soon as you started talking about housing in Long Island, I did my, oh, everything just went back. I said, I was about to reference, well, let's go back to the power broker. hundred <laughs> percent. And by the way, Robert incredible. Moses' desk is in this office, by the way. Really? Yes, That's I, so I, cool. I Huh. Work that is like right I here. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll chime in, uh, perhaps less interestingly, with um, got my hands on the Doris Kern Goodwin book that's been out for a while, Leadership in Troubled Times, comparing Lincoln, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson, fascinating comparisons. And uh, on TV, to the extent that I can watch it regularly, I'm hooked on Yellowstone. I think I want to be Kevin Costner when I grow up. I think that, <laughs> that's my aspiration. <laughs> is a very cool dude. Righty, all right, well, I wanna thank you. I'm gonna turn this back over to Tanya. And I guess, Abney, to close this out, I wanna thank once again, Melva Miller for the invitation today. I hope I did at least a, a, a 30, I did good for 30 seconds. And I wanna thank them for this and thank you all for your insight. Thanks for moderating, you were great. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. And again, if you have any questions about the Abney Young Professionals and the kind of events, the, the conversations that we're able to have, please don't hesitate to reach out, email me. I'll put my, my email in the, um, in the chat. And uh, thank you so much to our panelists and our moderator for this incredible discussion. I mean, I'm typing out quotes as we speak. So really, thank you. Thank our you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Pleasure to be with you all.